welcome back to the bxg podcast this is episode number 91 the date is march 21st as this posts march 21st and that means that we are on oscar week as oscar i'm week. <clears throat> and we've been reviewing a lot of the oscar films and last week on last monday's episode we fixed the oscars and obviously we talk a lot about movies around here at the bxg so we thought it would be a good idea to maybe just kind of take the time and talk about what we think makes a good movie. And so I'm one of your hosts, Brent Beswick, alongside my co-host, Mr. Gregory Filson of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. It'd be cool if I was. It would be cool, but but you are in fact not. No. Uh, so what makes I have you- been there though. That's cool. Is that in LA? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what makes a good movie? And we're looking at this from all perspectives, right? What's a good popcorn movie? What's a good Oscar bait movie? What's a good so bad that it's funny or so bad that it's good movie? And then at the end, kind of judging by all the factors, <clears throat> uh, what do you think is the quote unquote greatest movie of all time based on your criteria, not necessarily your favorite movie, unless of course they are the same but the greatest movie of all time. So I have seven factors of a good movie. Uh, Plot, setting, casting, score, accessibility, rewatchability, and whether or not it stands the test of time. Yeah. So we'll just go through in that order. Factors of a good movie, plot. What are you looking for in a plot? Of a good movie or, or a great movie. I am looking for a, it, it, when you're telling me a story, when you're telling me a story, whether it's a movie, a book, television show, I need to know. And, and it may be, this may not be as like cut and dry, but the good and the bad. And, you know, not necessarily who you're rooting for because you might be rooting for the bad guy in a movie. A lot of movies are actually like that where you root for the bad guy. But I need to know the parameters. I need that there. I need to know in a plot that there's actually something at risk. To me, I think that is the biggest thing about a plot, and it is. It can be a silly at risk, you know. I I, and the way to go is is like I think a way to look at this is Wedding Crashers. It's a silly at risk, you know. For anyone who's seen that, these are just two guys trying to find the at risk is that they get caught because they do this thing where they crash weddings. That is a silly at risk, but that hooks you. That hooks you very early on. That movie, you know, it may not necessarily stand the test of time for other reasons, but that is a silly plot that gri- that drives you as much as like, you know, if you look at The Godfather or you look at Goodfellas, you kind of understand the, and sometimes those, those lines are blurry, but you still kind of see what it is. Um, I think a lot of times that's where movies go wrong very early is that, they don't even know what the plot is and they don't know what the good or the bad. And it's not even the good versus bad. It's just this versus this. And because everything has that, there is always something, whether it's just a person versus themselves, that can be a plot line. So for me, it's having a conflict of some sort to me is I think is what works. So I, I agree with you. The conflict needs to be, kind of spelled out but for me that kind of factors into the overarching theme of what i'm looking for with a plot which it needs to be coherent and (laughs) you know it needs to be coherent even if it's something that's completely incoherent like say anchorman right it needs to be coherent it needs to have it, it can't be too predictable right right you need to have some twists and turns. That's why I don't think as good as that a lot of them are biopics are that great of movies because we all know how things turn out for <laughs> right. Ray Charles, right? Or whomever. Like those are good. Those are movies in the sense that <clears throat> they're they're acted well, but they're not necessarily movies where the plot is what's what you're invested in so it's got to be coherent uh there's got to be some it can't be too predictable and i do think that it needs to 
to spell things out, like not hit you over the head, but make you aware of what's going on and, and, and that sort of thing. That moves us to the next piece, which is setting, which obviously can tie into the plot very greatly. Uh, but what are you looking for in the setting of a great movie? This is, I think to me, maybe setting might be the toughest because I like movies that are sunny and, you know, have a lot. And sometimes it's, but I think the underlining thing is whether it's sunny, cloudy, dark, bright as day, there has to be an underlying grittiness to it. And that sounds weird because you may see this, but like, you know, it can be that perfectly shiny car, but there's just like a little scuff mark on it that just gives a little bit, you know, oh, this car has been through some stuff or this character has been through some stuff and the characters can be the setting. But, you know, I, I think a good example of this is La La Land. It's very bright, you know, when you first start out, um, if you've seen it, it's on the freeway. It's on this freeway in LA. So it's very bright and sunny but it, you're also stuck in traffic. And it's that funny thing of like, oh, it's so bright and sunny, but the, the price you pay for living in a place like Los Angeles is you're stuck in traffic. It takes a little while to get places because of that kind of thing. So for me, it's having a little bit of like dirt under the fingernail, the perfectly polished fingernail with a little bit of dirt underneath is kind of what for me is a setting is, just it, that could be a happy or a sad movie. I think, you know, really funny movies have a little grit under them just enough to make it, you know, if you're, you know, licking a white turd, it's something like that, or it's just Step Brothers. You know, it's just stuff like that where it's just enough to twist it to make it just semi dark enough. It, even if only 1% of it's dark enough, you need a little kind of darkness to it. For me, what I'm looking for with setting time and place, right? Mm -hmm. I need the setting to be a character unto itself. Sure. And that's, yeah, yeah. Environmental storytelling. I can think of great ones. Gotham City, right? We just did the Batman. Gotham City is its own character. You know what I mean? Gladiator, I think, is another one that utilizes the scenery, the Coliseum is a living, breathing entity within that mm. movie. You know, this, the, the stands and so on. Moana, right? The, sure. the, the colors that are used in the animation are very, you know, they're very vibrant. I, I feel like, you know, the ocean, the islands, they're their own character. You know, I think that American Psycho. 80s, that was going to be when I was, yeah. 80s, 80s New York. Yeah. Yeah, 80s New York is is the setting in and of itself, that city, right? So these are all the things that make make for a great setting. You know, I, I, would, ref, I would reference a lot of West. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly mm. uh, is another one where the setting is its own character where the characters, the man with no name, Clint Eastwood is hardened by the land that he lives in. Right. So that's, what's important to me. It can't be, you know, we've seen, Oh God, how many times has New York been the setting of any movie? It's like throwaway. You know what I mean? Like comedies, whatever, go somewhere else, do something different. The rom-com is probably the, and I actually, I like rom-coms. I think, you know, there's, but there is that thing where it's like, it's autumn in New York. Right. And this is the most beautiful time of the year. It's like, well, yeah. you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. And right. that's the thing that kind of takes you apart from those movies, unless it's being a tongue in cheek version of that, where it's like, it's autumn in New York, but like literally the second they say that the main actor steps in like dog crap, you know, it's like <laughs> something like that, you know? And yeah. so like, you know, and, and you're right. It's just, and I think both of us kind of in the same way, we said the same thing. It's just in a different way. I was looking for the grittiness for like that, the care the setting is a character because it's gritty and it offers something that you know kind of tells you the storyline and then you're just saying like the way gotham is is its thing and uh 80s new york is its thing yeah so the next point is the casting and i think that this really resonates 
when you go back and look at our review of the MCU that we did through the summer last summer. And one of the things that we did, we listed was <clears throat> all of the people who came very close to playing some of these different roles. Uh, does the MCU succeed if Tom Cruise is, is Tony Stark? Does the MCU succeed if John Krasinski, who is, by the way, a much better actor than Adam Driver. Apropos as, of nothing. As what? I, apropos of nothing. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I just, it meant, like, we wouldn't reference anything to say that. But Oh, yeah. okay. Well, Greg, <laughs> so, Greg's pontificating. Um, you know, would, would, would superior to Adam Driver actor John Krasinski have sold Captain America as well as Chris Evans, right? So the casting has to be just right. Oh, yeah. You got to have casting just right. I mean, you know, I think Marvel is definitely a big theme, but I think one of the key elements of casting to me has been James Bond. It's something I really, really like. And, you know, there's been really good James Bond, Sean Connery, and, you know, Pierce Brosnan. Uh, not Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> and, it, and it's not necessarily, you know, my thing is like, I love Daniel Craig. I, and, you know, this is, I'm someone that grew up, I used to watch all the Sean Connery, uh, James Bond movies. I love Sean Connery. I'll always hold a special place, but like, Maybe I'm just someone that likes that rougher edge, but there's something about Daniel Craig having that rougher edge because, like, if you actually get into like the 007 things, like that guy went through some stuff and he has to show that he's been through some stuff. And that is that problem with those 007 movies with Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan's like, he's too handsome, like, he's too clean. And it doesn't look like he's been through some things. And that's where those movies falter. I mean, it was rough. I mean, I did not like those movies. I don't. A, you know, a lot of people think GoldenEye is a good movie. I think they think it's a good movie because the rest of those are actually so bad that, yeah, that's what, I mean. That's it's, why people remember because of the video game. Yeah. Because of the video game. Right. But, like, that movie is just, you know, it is just, it, it's, <laughs> it's your dog pooped out, you know, some cornflakes instead of the dog food or something. It's just, it's not. A lot of dog shit references so far. I just like dog shit references. I don't know. I think it's because of what I was teaching in school today with like verbs, and they went, they went, they went the route that ten year olds will do. But um, it, it's just one of those things where it's just like he didn't fit the role. He was sure. too clean cut, and he was too polished. And there has to be something about if you're playing a person that's been through some stuff, you kind of have to look like you've been through some things. And this isn't taking, I think Daniel Craig is a very handsome guy, but he looks a little ragged. He looks like someone that's kind of seen some stuff. And I think that is very important to me. That is what I expect. If you've been through some things and I, since I referenced uh, wedding crashers earlier, it's just that, you know, Owen Wilson looks like somebody that's kind of depressed doing this. Before you even actually know he's depressed, he actually looks like he's depressed and be do it, doing this kind of thing just to kind of take a funny movie and doing that spin is like you have to look like the character you're portraying. And, you know, as much as we like seeing movie stars in movies, I mean, you know, we do love that. And there's nothing wrong with there's a reason why people are movie stars. But if you're not a movie star, you do have to look like the character you're playing and act like the character you're playing. And I, to, to me, that is really, if two seconds in, you're telling me this guy is from Boston and the guy can't carry a Boston accent to save his life. I'm out, you know, I'm just out. Yeah. I think that, you know, the bond thing is obviously a good pool as far as this, I think some other ones that are really obvious Batman, you know, sure. we've seen right, some, really right. sh we've seen some dog shit Batman. Uh, I think that Henry Cavill, is perfectly cast as Superman, which is a really a big shame because that studio has really mishandled him in that role. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> you know, anytime that you have like the like multiple opportunities to get a character right, it's easy to see the good and the bad of that sort of thing. You know, we've seen 
different versions of Jack Ryan through both movies and, and the TV show and, and that sort of thing. But yeah, it's important to nail that character to have the person, like you said, if it's based on something, have them have that feel, or I'll tell you what the other one that I would say is maybe the best job of casting that I've seen is Daniel day Lewis is Abraham Lincoln, because he's like the DNA. It's Lincoln. pretty weird. It's, it is, you know, like nerve deep, how much he embodies the, that character, you know? And then there's other times where it's like, you cast somebody and then they don't necessarily fit the bill, what you're looking for. I think a great example more recently of that is red notice with the rock trying to have like romantic chemistry, right? Right. Just in general, you know what I mean? It's not something that he pulls off super well. Uh, moving on. Another thing that I think is very important and it's important in the sense that we know the names john williams we know the names danny elfman we know hans zimmer just as an example ludwig gordonson but the score of a film this is one of those things that you don't think about if you're watching movies at home as much because as good as your sound system would be at home and you can have a really good one it's not the same as being in a theater and i was thinking about this you know, when we saw Penelope Cruz live and they were showing the movie she did with Pedro Almodor. And it was like, we're see I've seen some of these movies and some of the other Spanish movies she had done, but I had only watched those on TV. And, you know, it could have been 20 years ago, 15 years ago. And I just, you know, whether I have my little, you know, stereo hooked up or whatever. And then you realize how important that, that just background is to how good that is to see that in the theater. And, it's something that, you know, you don't necessarily think about until you actually think about it. And you, that's, you, you think of the famous people, but there's so many people that aren't famous that do this or doing a terrific job just pacing that movie along. And, you know, um, it, I, this, I, I think a good reference to this since we're, you know, we're in the, is the way the Batman works and with Nirvana mm -hmm. is like that song shot up, you know, 728 percent 728 percent because it really fits the theme of it it's kind of this punk rock you know emo version of batman and it's like you don't even think about it you don't but it is ingrained in you and like i i, I like nirvana i'm not so I, we've talked about this before i don't think nirvana is like the be all end all when it comes to that version of music i think they are important in the fact that they change that direction but like, I was like, I need to listen to Nirvana after this now. Like, I'm okay. Like, it was like, this gets me in that mood. And when a movie does that without slamming it in your face, there's something important about that. Now, of course, Star Wars is nothing without the right. music. Yeah. This just isn't. And like, we all kind of get that Avengers theme in our head. It, you know, even if you don't think about it, you do kind of have that little bit of that theme in your head. And does that make or break Avengers? No, but there is something about like that movie. When you hear that music, even if you watch those movies 10 times, it still kind of gets you. And to me, it's like, if that movie kind of gets you pumped, Jaws is another really good example. Well, that's the one that I was going to hey. say is Jaws yeah. is Jaws as scary without the score because no way it builds so much tension. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and other movies that I would say, you know, Batman 89, Danny Elfman, uh, no, Hans Zimmer. Uh, I think, you know, Wonder Woman, uh, a great score with her whole like theme situation. I mean, these characters have theme songs and that's a thing. You know, I would say even the Bond movies, you know, you get like the, oh, Bond, Bond, you know, yeah. the Bond girl, Bond theme song, whatever. You know, I think of Adele with Skyfall. Mm -hmm. uh, Jurassic Park, obviously, another huge one with with that score. Again, John Williams, Indiana Jones, another one. You know, that's an iconic track. I will just is Guardians of the Galaxy even watchable without that soundtrack? Without no. the soundtrack, right? No. It isn't. 
I mean, it's that tough, is what yeah. actually carries both of those movies. Now, the second one is a disaster, and the but the music is at least fine. Yeah. But that first one, I mean, that's what gets you going. Right. Yeah. You know, that's that's a great. You know, it's just one of those funny things where like a movie can be bad, but if the music's good enough, you can at least enjoy it. So moving on, I kind of want to take these next three sort of all together, and that's accessibility, rewatchability, and stands the test of time. So rewatchability is obviously, you know, how rewatchable is the movie. And then standing the test of time is like Wayne's World is a great example of a movie that does not test the time, stand the test of time. Uh, Accessibility, what I mean by that is how, and this is plot, to an extent plot setting and so on but how easy is it to watch a movie and i don't mean that in the sense that it's like mindless per se like fast and furious but interstellar is one of my favorite movies but you almost need like a goddamn doctor to be able to understand it at the highest level you know i would say tenet is another movie that's not super accessible because of the way that the sound is done i would say that a movie such as uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, probably not super accessible because it is a foreign language film and it's with subtitles, right? So kind of taking all these together, accessibility, rewatchability stands the test of time. To me, I think think rewatchability and... uh, stands the test of time or kind of in the same thing because if something can stand the test of time then it probably makes it more rewatchable because there may not be cringy moments or like the references aren't dated wayne's world is a perfect that's i mean you can't hit the nail on the head more than wayne's world not staying the test of time the yeah, movie the time, was i think it was very rewatchable it was at insanely rewatchable within five years. And then honestly, after five years, the references were very dated to that era. It's, it's very funny. It may have been the most rewatchable movie of five years in that time period. Like any time period, it may have been a five-year watchable, more th- rewatchable than anything. But after that, it just fell off a cliff, True. you know? And it's like, but and if we're going to stay in that kind of round, like Caddyshack kind of still works. You know, yeah. and it, it's like, it's an older movie, but it's just golf. It's people making jokes. There's nothing there that's like super outdated. The thing that hurts movies a lot of times, but sometimes doesn't hurt a movie. That's so weird is how people use phones. Yeah. And if phones are used a lot, and I'm talking like a landline, then you think about it. If a landline is only partially used, you don't think about it at all. Because then you start to realize this is kind of, this is a TV reference. But it's my Seinfeld thing where I was like, Seinfeld, there is some phone references, but those phone conversations are never important enough that they actually like dictate the show. So if you're, if you're using the phone too much, it can kind of distract from it. But, and it's a weird thing to say because we, but if all you're doing is talking on a phone and you're not worrying about anything else, then you can kind of understand because we all still talk on a phone. Um, I would say that, you know, standing the test of time has to do with a lot of different things. Um, Obviously, technology. If you use too much of it or you don't use enough of it, that's weird. If you don't use any, I think that's actually your best thing. If it's people in cars and it's people talking, your movie has a lot better chance of standing the test of time, Uh, which is probably, you know, when we get to their actual, like, best movies. I think the worst thing you can do to, like, stand the test of time is if you're just so in on that year of like you know whatever that technology was everything that happened that year you have in that movie it's just not going to work yeah 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 i would agree with you especially on that the other thing that i would say about accessibility is that i think the sweet spot is a pg-13 movie i think that you lose accessibility and you skew too young and then unless it's something really special and then you skew obviously a lot of people if it's rated R and it has too much like language, sex, violence, drugs, whatever. So I think that that sort of like the PG, PG 13 is really the sweet spot in terms of. 
I think that's why they almost created PG thirteen. Yeah, you yeah, know, it's, just to it's, hit that accessibility. Yeah, it is. I think that that is, and then also, like I said, it can't be something that's too like too technical in one sense or the other. I think Interstellar is the perfect movie to talk about, but I also think a movie that is, well, we just recently reviewed the power of the dog, right? I, I, it's a great, it's a very good movie. It's Oscar worthy. It has no rewatchability. And I wouldn't say that it's terribly accessible because it's, I believe it's a rated R movie. It is. Yeah. And it's long and it's not very action filled. So this is like an actor's, this is like a, like an actor's movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and that's the thing with accessibility too, is I think you have to have some level of action. You have to have some level of comedy. You have to have some level of, you know, and I guess that that kind of ties into the plot as well. <clears throat> so based on the criteria that we have discussed, uh, give me a couple movies that you say that you would say are, you know, up there f- hitting all those notes. And then what do you think is your greatest movie of all time? I feel like Based Nick on- Cage. <laughs> and, you know, how do you pick your favorite movie um, or the <laughs> best movie of all time? You know, I've gone on on, you know, my favorite movie. It's gone back and forth. It's either going to be American Psycho or it's going to be Field Dreams. And that's my favorite. You know, it, that, that, and that varies. It just kind of depends. Do I think those movies are the greatest movies ever made? No, I do not. Yeah, you know, I, I am not of, of that mindset. Uh, but the movies I maybe think are the greatest movies of all time are not necessarily the most rewatchable movies either. It was just such a weird thing. It's like, for me, if I'm going to sit and I just, let's say, I guess the way to look at this is like a character study of myself. I have to pick one movie that I have to watch and I know it's good. And I kind of want to even say it's like the last movie you get to watch because that's not fair either because I probably would pick, you know, something different. But like, I guess if you're, I guess the, this is probably the best way I could do it. This is tough. And I've thought about this a lot. I guess you're, you're doing a film class and you're like, this is what could be considered, you know, the way you should make a movie. And you go a lot of different ways. A lot of people will say Citizen Kane. A lot of people go a different way. For me, a lot of people will say Godfather 2. I think sometimes you have to go at the beginning and just start. I think if you're going to do it, you have to watch Godfather 1 and just to see how a movie should be made. Now, it is it entirely rewatchable? Yes and no. It is a long movie. It's very well done. It is very well done. Um, it's it's that or it's Goodfellas for me. Both two movies very well done. Italian, you know, mob scene, a, a good enough amount of action. Obviously, the actors are really well constructed. Goodfellas is more rewatchable. It's probably slightly a lesser movie but it's also just a standalone movie you kind of know what you're getting into with uh with godfather it's so weird for me to like go this direction but it's just like i haven't watched the godfather the original one in probably 10 years i do think it is an absolute masterpiece as most people do but do i think it's rewatchable only partly and this is where it becomes so challenging to decide. I don't know anymore. I like, to me, I would rather watch a movie like Bullet or, you know, Steve McQueen or The Color of Money because I have Paul Newman, I have Tom Cruise. And I think that movie is still technically well done. And I think if I'm actually breaking down what I think, I think personally, and this is, actually finally breaking it down i think to me the best movie of all time that fits all these criteria is the color of money i really do believe it fits all these things because you have paul newman more at the not the end of his career but more in the latter half of his career you have tom cruise at the height of his career it's 
a movie reflecting back on an old Paul Newman movie, The Hustler. And it's all, it has the grit. It has the setting. You know, the billiard room is a character in this movie. And, I, you know, and I really thought long and hard about this, but I really, truly believe that when you factor all this in, to me, I, I really do believe it is an underrated movie. And I think, to me, it, it may actually be the best movie of all time in the way it's constructed because it is also that main thing is it is rewatchable. I've watched that movie more than I have watched more most other movies that necessarily, you know, aren't Marvel or something like that, but that's different. As a movie built to be taken seriously, I have probably watched it more than anything. I can't say I've ever seen that. <clears throat> it's I'm great. not a Tom it, Cruise I, I, guy. You're not a Tom Cruise guy. It's it's Tom Cruise at the height of his power, but kind of playing a different character. And then it's it's Paul Newman. Yeah, I do like Paul Newman. Yeah. Uh, this was actually really easy for me. Okay. Based on this criteria, right? Right. Let me tell you about a little movie called Paddington. To, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> not wrong. Not wrong. I just never. <laughs> I've never seen it, so I can't. Right. I can't judge it. Yeah. Factors of a good movie. My 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 selection has a good plot. It's tight. It's coherent. It has certainly has twists that that you don't see coming if you're seeing it for the first time. Uh, the setting. It 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 happens across multiple arenas. Uh, but in each case, the setting provides its own environmental storytelling, its own uh, living, breathing world. The cast is perfect. Um, the score is undeniable, one of the most famous scores of all time. I believe it's accessible <clears throat> because it, it is that PG, PG-13 rating. Kids can watch it and enjoy it. Adults can watch it and enjoy it. It's it's one of the most infinitely rewatchable films of all time. And it certainly stands at the best of time. And I genuinely believe, and I know that people are going to roll their eyes and say whatever, but I genuinely believe that The Empire Strikes Back is the greatest movie of all time. I, it hits I, every yeah. single it hits every one note. of those bullet points. The cast is perfect. Harrison Ford not yet the curmudgeonly old man that stands before us today. The plot, you know, <clears throat> one of the most iconic scenes in the history of film when Vader is revealed to be Luke's father. The settings, Dagobah, Hoth, Cloud City, the asteroid field, all different in their own way, but all important. And like I said, tell the story, assist in right. telling the story. Obviously, the score we talked about, John Williams' score for the Star Wars movies. Uh, and then, like I said, infinitely rewatchable, very accessible. Anybody can pick it up. The nice thing about this with seeing the test of time is because there were there wasn't any CG, right? The special effects were all done with stop motion and miniatures. Right, right, right. And so that helps it visually hold up. You know what I mean? It's not super campy. It's not uh, over the top. It's not like unnecessarily and needlessly funny, like the way that that subsequent Star Wars movies have been. It's just it's a it's a masterclass in science fiction. It's the science fiction movie, right? Yeah. And it is in the top, you know, top fifteen, top ten, top five movies of all time like regardless of what what site you go by but i really do believe that it's it it hits the note of this is an awesome movie that's also a popcorn movie this is yeah. a well directed well acted movie and it's also like a fun science fiction action movie yeah yeah i i just you know like i said i know people are going to roll their eyes with me being like the star wars guy and, and i don't think so i think more people will probably roll their eyes at me because i went more under the radar and sure. oh paul newman you know i think you're probably more in like what people think of and i'm i think you're actually i i want to say because i i think the score in the color of money is also very good too um i just it's so weird it's so weird to say like what is the best movie yeah 
in, in the same way, but to narrow it down to those things, that's what makes it different. It's like if we had different criteria, a different movie may actually actually make the list. But sure. based on that criteria, it's just like, you know, I think I don't – There's obviously there's no wrong answer except for uh, the Green Book and the Fish Fucking movie. Uh, if you say those, you're wrong. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I you know, I just think – because it's easy to say like well my favorite movie you know like you said right, right, right. You know, my favorite movie depending on the day is either braveheart or american psycho right i mean i know star wars is in my top five i know empires in my top five whatever but i just think from a craftsmanship standpoint the way it's constructed the whole way and the way it's presented and the characters and the, and the sound you know the, mu- the music and the setting and everything i just think that it's a perfect i like i know we said the other day or the other episode when we did the batman that the dark knight is you know you said a 9.9 because there's nothing that's a perfect 10 but i legitimately believe that the emperor strikes back is a perfect 10 out of 10 movie it's as close as there can be i will say that it is one of those ones where it's like it's, if there is there is that you know yeah. so this has been kind of our month you know the monday episode oscar week leading up to the oscars what makes a good movie uh you can go back and check out our conversation on fixing the oscars because it's in a it's in a need of a facelift you check out some of our reviews for some of the, the films that were nominated for best picture uh there's a playlist over on the youtube channel 2022 oscars with dune power of the dog coda don't look up maybe some other ones there's some of the movies that are nominated for other awards like um missiles versus machine on nominated for best animated spider-man no way home nominated for effects i can check those out on the youtube channel um and you can check us out on other social media platforms at facebook.com slash bxg podcast instagram at bxg podcast at gt feels at y2b uh twitter at gt filson at bxg podcast at y2b and the bxg podcast posts every friday and monday at 9 a.m eastern standard time 6 a.m pacific 4 a.m hawaiian aloha on podcast services around the globe i uh, hope you enjoyed the discussion if you did give us no less than four stars over on apple uh, as we try to climb our way towards the required number for the rotten tomatoes tomato meter yeah, certified let's critical. do it so on and so forth. Uh, Take care, friends. Have a great week. Thanks for listening.